Uh, my name is Emily Kubota, and I'm the curator at the Lynchburg Museum System. We have been working on a project um, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment being ratified, giving women um, the right to vote. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a presentation of uh, a summary, more of a presentation, a summary of part one of our exhibit, which is on display now, and part two will be coming later this summer, and part three and four will be art installations, and so they will be forthcoming as well. We are doing this in partnership with the Riverviews Art Space. This was originally planned for March of 2020 in celebration of Women's History Month, and at Riverviews, they are hosting an exhibit um, from the artist Susan V. Paddock, and she has an exhibit called Coincidental Feminism, the Women Portrait Project. She has a collection of portraits that she's done of local women from Lynchburg and Bedford area and um, it's celebrating you know the uh, the feminism and all of them not necessarily their exterior beauty but also highlighting their inner strengths and inner beauty and it's um, a, f a strong focus on feminism outward and inward the um, we the women exhibit encompasses four different parts Part one, Battle for Ratification, focuses on the time period leading up to the ratification of the 19th Amendment and um, the struggles that the women fought against and um, the issues that were going on in their time. So this is really a summary of what it was like for women um, before they were getting the right to vote. Part two focuses on um, the consequences of that. The issues that were prevalent during the 19-teens and late 1800s were largely impacting women, but because women didn't have the chance to vote, they had no say in a lot of these issues. Of course, the Great War, or as we know it today, World War I, was going on, and it took place from 1914 to 1918. More than 115,000 deaths of American soldiers ravished the country, and most families knew someone who had died overseas in the fighting. So of course this touched the vast majority of Americans and women included in that. Women might not have been overseas doing the fighting, but they were heavily involved in the war effort at home despite not having the right to vote. There was an influenza pandemic going around as well in the late 1910s. Um, the influenza pandemic started in 1918. It lasted roughly to about 1919. We did see some resurgence after that, but um, it caused a massive amount of deaths in America. 675,000 people died, um, including many here in Lynchburg, although Lynchburg's fatalities were not nearly as high as the rest of the countries. Another major issue, a large political issue that women were passionate about and also had no say in was child labor reform. In 1900, about 18% of workers in America were children and that made up about 20% of the workforce. Children were wanted to work in factories because they had small hands um, that could fit into the machinery and they had small bodies that could go in between the parts and you could pay them relatively low wages. So um, children working in hazardous conditions, beyond hazardous, there's flat out dangerous and fatal. Um, children were largely involved in these factories as staff members and that was something that women were specifically fighting against and wanted to have a say in. So the picture on the slide here is from the West End Shoe Factory here in Lynchburg. It dates from 1911, and this is courtesy of the Library of Congress. And you can see just so many children are on staff there. So other issues that were um, happening in the country that women had no vote in were temperance. Um, the Prohibition Party, which was founded to fight temperance, or to fight for temperance, was founded in 1869, and it was the first political party to accept women as members. It's still around today, and it's the oldest existing third party. And uh, people familiar with history will know that right around the time women got the right to vote, uh, prohibition went into effect. So this was a major issue the country was talking about during this time. Another one, especially here in the South, were Jim Crow laws, which were um, legalized racism that were turned into laws to discriminate specifically against African Americans. Um, they were founded around 1896 under the, the court case Plessy v. Ferguson, and the Supreme Court upheld the separate but equal doctrine. So this meant that from 1896 and after, 
that African Americans had to have separate facilities, so this is separate places to eat, separate drinking fountains, separate restaurants, restrooms. Um, everything would be um, segregated from this point on, and it was put into law. So that meant African Americans had less opportunity as far as education, housing, employment, and the required code of etiquette meant that socially, African Americans were below white people at this time. And again, women had no say in it, whether they supported or were against it, they had no chance to vote for it either way. The women who were battling suffrage were also um, involved in the abolitionist movement. Um, most of them were um, working together in the early days. We would see a separation later on. Um, but in the years prior to the Civil War, suffragists and abolitionists a lot of times worked hand in hand together. Um, women like Sojourner Truth were um, uh, constantly fighting for the equal treatment of African Americans and also the equal treatment of women. Um, Frederick Douglass was another leader in this cause. And um, so they're considered feminists and abolitionists at the same time. The 15th Amendment was ratified after the Civil War in 1870. The 15th Amendment states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So this, although it did not specifically mention women, it did give black men the right to vote. Um, it ended race discrimination, but not gender discrimination. A lot of women, a lot of white women, I should say, were outraged by this because they felt like black men should not be given the right to vote before white women. This is when the activists started to separate. Susan B. Anthony and Katie, Elizabeth Cady Stanton split from the interracial groups like the American Equal Rights Association and the National Women's Suffrage Association, and they went on to found their own uh, segregated suffrage groups, leaving black women totally excluded from the movement from there on out. This is another image from the Library of Congress, and this is from a newspaper published in 1870, and you can see it's celebrating the result of the 15th Amendment, and you um, can see there are celebrations in the street, there are images of men surrounding the um, circle, and they're on the border, and at the bottom it says, final accomplishment, um, and it totally excludes women, which I think is unbelievable that you can exclude half of the country and have the word final in that statement. So women, black women and white women, were not included in this um, amendment, and um, this is really when we start to see the suffrage movement as we know it take form. This is a poster called The Awakening. It was published in a magazine called Pucks. And I got this image from the Cornell University website, although I think it's um, public domain on the Library of Congress too. And I think this, inter this is an interesting image for a couple reasons. Um, it shows the split in the country and the, the states on the west already had equal suffrage at this time. When the states were um, coming into the Union in the 1800s, part of the agreement was that they would keep equal suffrage for women. It was um, Wyoming first in 1869, followed by Utah, Idaho, Arizona, and Kansas. The party allegiance of these new states was unpredictable, and they thought by giving women the right to vote in the West that each politician would be benefited from it. Um, the Democrats thought that more women would vote Democrat, and the Republicans thought more women would vote Republican, so everyone was fine with women voting. However, in the East, the states that were already in the Union did not have the right to vote. And you can see um, the image of Liberty or another classical woman is marching towards the East, and she's pointing at the um, pit of men who are fighting her. So she's um, on a victorious march, and she's headed towards the east, and she's coming to um, deliver equal suffrage for women. White women began to organize in 1890 with the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And by the late 1910s, their membership had swelled over 2 million. So women all across the country, especially in the east, had formed this coalition to demand equal rights um, in America and equal voting rights.
They focused on equal suffrage at the national level and at the state level, um, depending on which one they thought would be more effective. And depending on the politicians in place, they were um, willing to get equal suffrage however it would come first, whether it was national or whether it was state. The women also um, began organizing picketing, which we'll see in the next slide. So they were very politically active, politically vis visible in Washington, D.C. And uh, they almost entirely excluded women of color. These are all white women, and they're women who um, are fighting for equal rights for women to vote, but not necessarily um, giving the care that, you know, it would include black women too. The uh, women that we see on the left are uh, called the Silent Sentinels, and they were women that would position themselves outside the gates of the White House day or night, whether it was cold or hot. We see them standing in a variety of weather conditions, and they had banners that were yellow and purple, and, or gold and purple, I should say, and they would hold signs. Um, they would be victims of harassment by the crowds, and they would later be arrested and um, harassed by uh, state officials. But uh, they were pretty well known as a, you know, you'd go to Washington, D.C., and that's who you would see standing outside the White House. Now, today, the White House is a really popular spot for people to protest in front of and picket, but at the time, no one had done that yet, so they were really revolutionary in that respect. Um, on the image on the right, we see a suffrage parade in New York City. And this is, um, I included it because you can see the large crowd that's involved. The women in the middle of the street are, um, some of them are wearing white and carrying signs. And then the massive amounts of crowds that showed up would either be there to support them or to sometimes antagonize them. So I mentioned that African American women were left out of the movement um, organized by white women, but that didn't mean that they weren't active on their own. We focus on a variety of African American women, if you come to see the exhibit, we have a lot of space dedicated to these pioneers. And um, I wanted to include some of their names in this PowerPoint as well. In this image, we have Mary Church Terrell. And she was the um, woman who established the Colored Woman's League of Washington, DC in 1893. So um, after the split between black and white women with the um, passing of the 15th Amendment. Her and Helen A. Cook were the um, founders of that. And by 1896, several national groups had joined together to form the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Um, so these clubs weren't just focused on suffrage. They were also um, wanting better conditions for the working class. They wanted better conditions for children. They wanted to take care of the elderly. They were um, taking the form of a lot of um, church groups and women's leagues that were you know, active in a variety of causes, and they would band together. And one of the causes was suffrage, but it was not the only one. The uh, mission of the NACWC was, quote, to secure harmony of action and cooperation among all women in rising to the highest plane of home, moral, and civil life. So again, it's not just about uh, suffrage, it's about making sure everyone was treated equally and had a fair shot and had what they needed. Women's groups became widespread and they gave women a voice in political affairs at a time when they couldn't vote. So if all women banded together and as a club they demanded certain changes, they had a better shot of having their voices heard than if they had just made those demands on their own. This is a um, image of an uh, executive board of the Women's League of Newport, Rhode Island, 1899. And this image is of five, I think they look very powerful, very in charge, they know what they want. And um, these women had self-organized despite being you know, left out of the national conversation. And we don't have any images of uh, African-American Lynchburg women's clubs, unfortunately, from this time. So if anyone has any and they wanna donate them or share them with us, we'd be happy to, happy to have scans of them at the very least. Um, but like I said, these clubs were all over. We know Lynchburg did have clubs similar to this where they were fighting for issues in their community and that did include equal suffrage. The battle for ratification wasn't just taking place on a federal level, it was also happening here in Virginia. 
But before we can get into the um, women's issues, I wanted to talk a little bit about voter issues in general that were happening here in Virginia. The Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1902 was um, held in Richmond and it had representatives from all over the state. And they, the result of it was the suppression of black voters by means of literacy tests and poll taxes. This made it nearly impossible for African American men to exercise their right to vote. Um, this was um, a response to um, how to handle men being considered, black men being considered citizens after 1870. And a lot of white supremacists at the time who were in power didn't think that it should be, um, it wasn't fair to them to have uneducated, poor men voting. And they saw a lot of black men as representing, you know, this kind of unfavorable group of people who they didn't think should have any say in their own politics. Voter suppression was effective and it dropped the black voter numbers from 147,000 to 21,000 just in the four years that it took place. One of the quotes that I found was from Senator Carter Glass and he is from Lynchburg. He lived in Lynchburg and he owned the papers in Lynchburg. And when asked if he thought that the literacy tests and poll taxes were a form of discrimination, he responded, discrimination, why that is exactly what we propose, to remove every Negro voter who can be gotten rid of legally without materially impairing the numerical strength of the white electorate. This is the world that these women were coming from. You know, these, a lot of these um, powerful men in Virginia were their husbands, um, their sons, and you know, a lot of women, although they were liberal in the sense that they needed, that they wanted um, to push the boundaries of what women were legally allowed to do, they still came from a background of being more, you know, traditional and conservative in some areas. The battle for ratification that was happening in the state um, did see a large um, push from the organization of white women. In 1909, the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia, founded by Leela Mead Valentine as president, was um, taking a lot of um, steps to be active in the streets of Richmond and to really push for change in the government from there. In 1916, the organization had grown to include 175 branch leagues across the state with membership numbering over 30,000. The um, women that you see here, were this photo was taken in Richmond in 1915 and it came from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, who were nice enough to allow us to use the image. And the uh, branch leagues across the state absolutely did include Lynchburg and the surrounding counties. So we are going to learn a little bit more about the local women in Lynchburg who are making a change. The Equal Suffrage League of Lynchburg was formally organized in 1910 with the leadership of Elizabeth Dabney Langhorne Lewis, Alice R. Harris, Ann Bannister and Jean C. Boatwright. These are the officers of the League in 1910. And these members would um, distribute literature at fairs and in the street. They would host suffrage markets to raise money by selling food. They hosted young activists at the suffrage school held at Randolph-Macon Women's College. And if you come to the next part of the exhibit, you'll see an example of what a suffrage school would look like. So it's a good reason for everyone to come back out. They helped circulate a petition in Virginia in 1912 um, aimed at convincing the legislature that uh, women needed to be included in the right to vote. And they would actually confront politicians face to face. And I think this is the best thing that they could have done. They um, would keep track of which politicians had voted which way, um, what statements they had made. And it was, um, you know, a, they were pretty confrontational about some of their tactics, which I think is probably was the most startling at the time because women were supposed to be so you know, quiet and meek. Um, these women would meet at the Virginian, the Carroll Hotel on Main Street and at the YMCA. So these spaces were open to them from the owners of these buildings who um, thought that, the, that they believed in suffrage. Um, so they did have some backing in the city locally. And they did, sur they did uh, organize the surrounding counties of Campbell, Nelson, and Appomattox. So these women were going out into the rural areas 
and um, trying to organize women that way. Jimmy Bug Middleton was a local woman. Um, she, as you can see by her picture, was African-American, so she was not allowed to be included in the suffrage groups that I talked about just now. She was born in Lynchburg in 1890, but she went to Howard University in 1909, and that is where she founded the historic Delta Sigma Theta sorority, along with 21 other women. So she's known as Founder Middleton within the organization. She organized a march and a suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in 1913, but unfortunately, all of the black women involved in that march had to march in the back. So although they were uh, active and getting equal suffrage for women, you know, they were on the same, the same side, they you know, were fighting for the same rights, they still had to march in the back. Um, Jimmy Bug would later go on to um, become a pretty prominent um, educator. She was a teacher, librarian, and she became the dean of a girls' high school in Raleigh, North Carolina. And in North Carolina, she also founded the Raleigh an Alumni Chapter of the sorority in 1938. Later on, her daughter would join the sorority, and her granddaughter, who I just learned was also in the sorority, and a great-granddaughter who I don't know is old enough to be in a sorority, but <laughs> she has a long line of women that came after her um, that were participating in the sorority as well. These are two of the most prominent figures that people in Lynchburg think of when you say a local suffragist. On the left, we have Dab Elizabeth Dabney Langhorn Lewis, and on the right is her daughter, Elizabeth Dabney Langhorn Lewis Odie. These paintings were both painted by Brookie Abbott, who was a relative of theirs, and they're both housed at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, so once again, they were kind enough to let us use these images. Elizabeth Dabney Langhorn Lewis, was born before the Civil War on a plantation, and throughout her life she would have strong Confederate ties. Although she was never openly racist towards um, black women wanting the right to vote, she had a strong sense of Confederate memory and um, was a product of her time. Her daughter, Elizabeth Dabney Langhorn Lewis Odie, was a little bit more progressive, and she went to school in Germany, and she was considered the more militant of the two. They would um, go together on speaking tours, and um, Elizabeth Dabney Langhorn Lewis Odie is um, one of the women who set up a school, a suffrage school and education center at Randolph-Macon. Both of them were incredibly influential in the suffrage movement, not only locally, but at a state level and also on a national level. Elizabeth Lewis would become president um, while Leela Valentine um, stepped down for a year. So Elizabeth Lewis actually was the president of the Virginia Suffrage Organization for a year. Here's um, two images of the women that are, um, I think, a little bit more exciting. So on the right, you see both women at a protest or a rally in Washington, D.C. in 1917. Um, they've got their banners, which I know it's hard to see, but it says votes for women, and their sashes have the gold and the purple bands. And we um, want people to come and interact with these two ladies, so we have um, cutouts of them in our exhibit. So if you come, you can actually get your picture taken with them, and there's a background of the White House. Um, so, you know, if you ever, if we ever um, get a chance to reopen after the pandemic, everyone can come and get their picture taken with them. Um, on the left is a younger Lewis, Elizabeth Lewis, um, and this image is um, property of the Lynchburg Museum, so she is a prominent local figure for more reasons than just her activism within the suffrage movement. Um, she was a pretty, um, she was considered a leading lady during her time. Elizabeth Odie was involved in um, some harassment when she was picketing one day in D.C. She actually had a sign ripped out of her hands, and um, that was fairly common, and women were expecting that sort of thing when they were um, protesting. The Cameron House, pictured here in 1910, was the headquarters in Washington, D.C., so suffragists would work out of this building, and this was um, you know, where they would leave from before they went on their marches, and this is where their supplies were housed. And in 1917, there was an attack on this building, and I can't even imagine how scary it would have been. Um, there's a very long description of it, which I'm not going to read at all, but it um, involved shots being fired, men climbing up the fence, ripping banners off the windows, um, 
there were arrests, but the only arrests that were made were um, made because someone had um, vandalized an American flag. So the harassment that the women suffered, no one was punished for. It was because they had desecrated an American flag. The um, people that were attacking the headquarters are the ones who did it. When they were ripping down their banners, they accidentally ripped down an American flag. So um, these attacks were fairly common, unfortunately, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The picture in this slide on the left shows a crowd in Washington, D.C. in 1913. And you can see that this is a huge crowd that showed up for a suffrage rally. And there's just a small number of suffragists in the center. And um, the caption of this photo led me to believe that these were people who were anti suffragists, that they were descending on the suffragists in an effort to stop them. And you can actually see that they're blocking off the parade as the women march forward. So I can't imagine the feeling that these women had knowing they're surrounded by this many people against them and still having the courage to stand there with their sign despite being outnumbered by massive numbers. The picture on the left shows a woman holding a sign um, aimed at Kaiser Wilson, which was a jab at um, President Wilson. And um, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment at this time. It was in the, well, towards the end of World War I. And um, the sign is accusing uh, President Wilson of having the same, uh, putting the same restrictions on women that he's fighting against in Germany. So it's comparing the women's suffrage movement over here to the plight of the Germans, which of course made a lot of people very angry, but she was making a very astute point. <laughs> this is um, the uh, headquarters for the party opposed to women's suffrage. And uh, their name was officially the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. This was taken in 1911. You can see there's some men and a woman standing there. And they had actually organized, they felt so strongly that women should not have the right to vote that they organized a party against them and uh, tried to do all that they could to stop suffrage from moving forward. The photo on the right is taken outside the Cameron House that I mentioned earlier. And there was a fire at the Cameron House. Women are taking their um, books and their papers and all the documents that they need. They're taking them outside and running into the burning building, carrying them back out, trying to save what they can. And the man on the right standing underneath the American flag is their neighbor. And he's standing there to make sure the women don't cross the property line. <laughs> so it's just so, so outrageous. There's a burning fire, a burning building. He is so opposed to their actions that he doesn't want them to cross his property line. Local opposition here in Lynchburg was led by Senator Carter Glass and his two local newspapers, The News and The Daily Advance. Senator Carter Glass was the one I mentioned earlier who flat out said that the aim of the Virginia Constitu Constitutional Convention of 1902 was discrimination. And he was the one leading these newspapers at the time. They were totally against women's suffrage and they would publish regularly their thoughts on it. So a 1913 editorial stated, quote, the news is uncompromisingly opposed to equal suffrage. It is profoundly convinced that the cause will never prevail in Virginia and that it does not deserve to prevail. And then after ratification in 1920, they stood by their statement with the quote, this newspaper has often gone on record against what it conceives to be the unwholesome trend of any policy that carries the flavor of federal interference with the suffrage rights of the states. And you can kind of get a sense from that, um, the argument for states' rights, um, which was an argument for the Civil War, that um, a lot of these people are the descendants of, you know, Civil War um, officers or soldiers, um, that this is a country that's still pretty freshly off the Civil War and it's still in living memory. Um, so the fear of federal rights interfering with states' rights was something that was very fresh in the mind of m many Southerners. The other um, opposition to women's um, suffrage, they would, um, they would hand out things that said, Quote, a vote for federal suffrage is a vote for organized female nagging forever. Uh, 
banners that said, no hen pecking in politics. Shall America collapse from effeminacy? It's up to you, son. <laughs> a woman's place is in the home and cartoons showing men doing women's chores and um, childcare. Of course, these men are not doing a very good job at it. And so that's the whole point is that like the woman's going off to work while the men is staying at home and the jobs are reversed in a like comical and bad way. Suffragists were often depicted as being ugly and deformed. Women were told they do not have the mental capacity to vote and that it was doing them a favor by keeping women out of politics. And they talk about men being forced out of his, his position as provider for the household. If women get the right to vote, it would be upside down, an upside down society. And especially if you get African American women to vote, you know, that would be giving them any sort of power would be totally counterproductive to what these um, white supremacists who were in government at the time were aiming to do. So by giving women to vote, the right to vote, it was going to turn society upside down in ways that we can't even imagine. So as we know, the federal ratification of the 19th Amendment did take place, and it occurred on August 18th, 1920. Not all the states were ratifying the new amendment right away, and Virginia did not do it until 1952. The last state to ratify was Mississippi in 1984. So luckily, the federal amendments overrode these state ones, but it still, I think it says a lot about the dates that it took these states to um, get on board with equal suffrage for women. Open registration lasted for one month, so women could um, register to vote, and um, it was a lengthy process, which we're talking about in part two of the exhibit. So we are going to give out sample ballots, go through the whole, um, the whole rigmarole of what it took to pay your poll taxes and to pass a literacy test and to pass a citizenship test. Despite all that, over 500 women registered, and not as many um, turned out as they were expecting. It was only about 10%. The Equal Suffrage League of Lynchburg turned into the Lynchburg League of Women Voters, and they are still around today. The African Americans who had organized in Lynchburg for equal suffrage formed the Lynchburg Voters League, and they have men in the league today. So there's, both of these leagues are still very active here in Lynchburg. And we're going to be talking a lot more about them in part two, and um, a lot more about um, the modern contributions of these uh, leagues today. I just wanted to include this because a lot of um, activity took place here and many black suffragists who were local, um, we don't know their names, we don't know the activities that they um, were organizing, we don't know um, the, formal, um, you know, the formal process they had, but we catch glimpses every once in a while of the um, organizing that was going on, although we don't have the documentation or the photos for it, we do know what was happening. And there's a little newspaper article that said that there was a meeting held at Merchants Hall, 413 Jackson Street. It was hosted by Dr. F. V. Bacchus, and the intent was to, quote, bring about the qualification of as many colored women as possible. So despite being left out of the story of suffrage um, in the mainstream way that we tell the story today, women of color have been involved from the beginning and if you know where to look and you know what you're looking for a lot of times you can find hints of that so this building is clearly not it doesn't have a plaque out in front of it it doesn't have a historic marker but there was quite a bit of history going on in the building there so what's coming up in part two um, we're going to open part two this summer it's still under construction and we are going to include information about the first 12 women in Lynchburg who registered in the first um, two days. I believe there were 22 women, so we're going to be talking about them. The first 12 were on the first day. What was it like for women to register? Literacy, I'm sorry, literacy tests, poll taxes, and citizenship questions. Oh, my. How did women voting change the face of politics? Randolph-Macon College um, student involvement and the vignettes of local scenes allowing you to step into the shoes of early women voters. So like I mentioned, if you come, you can take literacy tests and citizenship tests and pay your poll tax and have to go all over the city to do it. So um, it'll be a chance for people to really experience what it was like voting um, during that time and specifically for women who um, 
you know, I'm sure voting intimidation was pretty rampant and a lot of people were against it still, despite it passing on a federal level. So um, we're gonna talk a lot more about that and, um, you know, talk, get more into detail about some of these women. So everyone come out, um, part one is open and it's in the main gallery of the museum and part two will be upstairs in the Gifford Gallery and everyone is welcome to come. I wanted to thank um, everyone who has listened to the PowerPoint and um, you, like I said, everyone's more than welcome to come to our exhibits. We're open to the public and we're free. I also wanted to thank Riverview's Art Space um, for this opportunity and for being willing to, willing to work with us. Um, they have an exhibit called Coincidental Feminists, the Women's Portrait Project. So I wanted to thank Susan Paddock for the chance to um, kind of combine modern feminism with um, past feminism because I think that they tie in really well together and they are, you can't have one without the other.